It's time for the letter of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by the letter pi. Pi is for Perseus, the letter pi. Welcome back to My Seminary Life. I'm your host, Brandon Knight. This is our brand new series, Ancient Greece, where we are looking at how Greek culture from way back in the day influenced the context of the New Testament and also our current culture as well. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Greek mythology and To have this conversation about Greek mythology, I thought it would be really fun if we did it through the lens of the 1981 film Clash of the Titans. And I thought it would add an extra thick layer of fun to bring a couple friends along to have this conversation. So joining me today from Systematic Geekology and the Let Nothing Move You podcast, Christian Ashley. Christian, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Brandon. Good to be here. Of course. And your friend and mine, also from Systematic Geekology, Pastor Will Rose. Pastor Will, on this day in particular, it is very nice to see you. Hey, thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks for being um, inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, this, is, this is pretty fun because I'm sure I'm the only one recording right now who was alive when this movie hit the theaters. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yes, you are. I wasn't going to say it, but as long as you're going to bring it up. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll lift it up. I have a history with this. Movie. There we go. I have a history. I can't wait to share it. Um, awesome. Yeah, I I just want to ask Christian, though, is, is he going to be moved by today's episode? I just want to know. Be moved? Oh, no. Are you going to be moved? Nothing moves me. Nothing moves okay. him. Okay. Okay. He is... He is stoic. And with that very poor transition, let's get into today's episode. So before we get into the movie review itself, uh, I want to start off at this point um, talking about just this really interesting realization I had earlier today as I was watching Clash of the Titans that um, both Greek mythology and also Norse mythology as well, both started out as this, like an actual like major religion at one point in time. And now both of these have turned into some of the most popular IPs for pop culture, right? You know, I grew up in the late 90s during like the boom of Hercules. Hercules was everywhere again. Um, There was the Hercules Disney animated film. Kevin Sorbo was running around as Hercules on the live action show. As a child, I can remember in my uh, dress up, like my dress up bin as a kid, I had both costumes for both the animated Hercules and the uh, Kevin Sorbo version of Hercules. I went as one of them for Halloween. I think it was the animated version. So like, Greek, this Greek mythology stuff, like it's everywhere. It's everywhere still. So my question for you two, just to get this ball going, I'll go to Pastor Will first. What was your introduction to Greek mythology? It might have been Clash of the Titans 1981 on HBO as I watched 
thing over and over and over again when it came on HBO because it had swords and shields and uh, pretty women and uh, brief nudity and Medusa and a, a water monster. Like I, I was just like, man, this is cool. Like I, I think I learned about it a little bit in school. I, I, um, I'm definitely, I guess I was familiar with, you know, just in, in pop culture in general, who Zeus is and, and those kinds of things, but just kind of going into the lore and seeing the adventure on, on screen or whatever. I didn't, I don't think I read any books about it. Now my daughters are different cause they're like uh, Percy Jackson. They're like all into that. That mm. was their big thing. And they're so excited about this new TV show and series coming out on, on Disney plus. They couldn't be more excited and they really got into it that way. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that was it. And you know, I, I it really is like that. Yeah. If we're going to go down a rabbit hole of like, yeah, it was their religion, but it was also their stories around campfires telling stories of like, yeah. it was, it was the ancient version of the justice league. Right. You know, I mean, it was <laughs> like, these are their heroes and they got into, um, uh, uh, misadventures and made mistakes and redemption arcs and, and, and the hero's journey, all, all that so tied up into what they were doing in that culture and that religion that kind of shaped how they're understanding their worldview in the pantheon of gods. But, but like, yeah, we do it too. It's, it's not just, yeah, we have our entertainment with our stories, but I, I think there's also, we're trying to work out the human condition just like they were too. And the mysteries of why is there pain? Why is there nonsense tragedy? Why is there floods sometimes, but not others? Are the gods angry or, or, or is that something that I did because I was, um, uh, had too much hubris, all, all those things I think is, is interesting, uh, to me. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my history. Yeah, that's a, that is an appropriate, uh, rabbit trail to take us down. And one that I think we'll come back to throughout this episode of, yes, it was their religion, but it was also their way of making sense of things. And, through the art of storytelling and you guys over at systematic ecology, that's what you do on the regular is wrestle with yeah. how does the big story make sense through all these little stories that we tell each other as well. Hmm. Yeah. Christian, how about you? What was your introduction to this world of Greek mythology? I think I read a book when I was in first grade and was introduced to the concepts of Greek mythology. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Kept going, got into Norse mythology, saw the Hercules Disney movie. And I want to say there were like Osborne or Usborne or something like that. They had like the illustrated Greek and Norse mythology books they printed hmm. sometime after that. Got super into those. And as time went on, I started learning, okay, these are the kidified versions of the True. Greek myth. What are the actual ones about? And as I grew older, it's like, oh no, <laughs> there's a lot of bad, <laughs> a lot of bad in these. And it's one of those things too. Like, how do you approach something like this for a child? Do you go with the full story, or do you ease them in to other things? I was definitely eased in to Greek mythology, and I still appreciate it today. Like, I love exploring other cultures' mythologies just mm. to see how they look at this world. And I think Roger Kipling called it like the just so story of like, you know, this is why this happens. You know, it's just so, you know, you have Aesop's fables and stuff like that mm -hmm. telling us this is why a bat is considered to be not a mammal and not a not a bird because it didn't fight on either side in the war between the two and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Okay. I, I love exploring stuff like that. <laughs> Well, the good Ooh, news so is you're talking about like Greek, Greek mythology after dark. That was scandalous for Christian. Ooh, it was like Ooh. HBO after dark for Christian. Yeah, there's some so scandals. scandalous. Nice. Oh, scandalous. Here we go. Speaking yeah. of scandalous, we are going to do an episode on Aesop fables, which are very scandalous. Ooh. Hardly at all. Um, so I did think that I did assume, though, that Christian, you were the most well read of the three of us when it comes to Greek mythology. And that is because back at the every tribe denomination and tongue convention at pastor Will's church back in May, one of the panel discussions was a whole church episode. And you know, Josh, he has to start it with that silly question to get everybody happy and feeling good about each other. And it was like, build a 
dodgeball team out of mythology gods or something like that. And I said somebody, I forgot who I said, I may have said Achilles, and you were sitting next to me and you go, technically a demigod, but I'll allow it. And that's when I knew Christian really knows this stuff pretty well. And I don't. So I'm glad you get to bring a little bit of expertise into this conversation. Yeah. And according to TJ, I'm the only one who think I won that round of silly questions. And I still do. I stand by my decisions. The th- I don't know who you picked, but I could tell there is a lot of intentionality going into his choices here. <laughs> so let's get in now to the movie itself. So this is the 1981 clash of the Titans. Um, this movie stars, so the, okay, so honestly, the only person I recognized was, recognized was Ernest Bornine. That was the only name that I knew of this group of people. Um, but this is a nice, cheesy, nerdy, classic film. I don't know if it's like a classic by way of 80s classic films, but it is a nice, nerdy, classic film. Pastor Will... I know you watched it recently. For those of you listening and watching at home, if you want to check this movie out, it is on Max. That is apparently the streaming platform for it. I did find it on YouTube for free, so maybe go check that out as well, but it is on Max. Pastor Will, can you summarize for us what is the the story going on here in Clash of the Titans? Oh, so, um, yeah, um, excuse me. (coughs) Sorry, I have to edit that out. Um, I'm just so choked up, ready to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, going back just a little bit, like I, I, I made the joke that I, I saw it. Um, I, I saw it, you know, I was alive when it came out, but I didn't, I don't know if I remember ever seen it in the theater, but it was a, like a constant on HBO. And I was like an HBO kid. Okay. Like it was that channel you watched during the day. They had like somewhat kid, movie pg movies and at night you did have after hours you had radar movies that kind of stuff so i we watch H, uh, hbo a lot and so my my wife and i rewatched it last night we watched it on youtube as well i didn't know it was on um max or i, I have that but um i was like "Cindy, you remember this movie she's like oh yeah i watched this a lot because we both grew up just watching hbo so many times it's whatever they play on hbo we just watched the repeat so um for me like seeing this movie and at the time I still knew the special effects was pretty bad. Like it, it, um, it, it, um, it, but, but the claymation and the monsters and that kind of feel of like those monsters coming alive, a, a different tone or feel than even the, the humans that are doing it was, uh, it's, it's just so good and so classic, but it, basically it's, it's the basic story of like, the gods being angry at the humans or the humans trying to appease the gods. And then amongst the gods, they have these complicated nuanced relationships where they're jealous of one another. They're jockeying for power. They have their favorite humans or their son or daughter that they, um, you know, ran off and, and got somebody pregnant down on earth. And so they're watching over them and protecting their own favorite people. And so you kind of start off with this, um, this this ruler whose whose daughter uh, got knocked up by by Zeus, and then he's like, and I was just like, got to get rid of her, you know. It, either she's back. I can't, what what I can't I can't remember. Was he like doing it because he thought he was cursed or mad at her or trying to appease the gods? What was the very beginning? Why why was he doing this? Why was he getting rid of? In the original <sighs> myth, it was because there was a prophecy that his grandson would kill him one day. So he kept uh, denied at Danae, how the heck you want to say her name, in this tower away from everyone else. And then Zeus came, as Zeus does, and had his way, leading to okay. Perseus being born. But he couldn't gotcha. like kill them because kin slaying is a very thing, evil thing. So they just put them in this coffin into the sea. So like I'm not really the ones killing them. I think that yep, comes up right. a little bit more in the remake in 2010 as well, which, by the way, is a perfectly fine that, movie. Though. It's fine. It's got Liam Neeson in it, but this one's more fun to talk about. That's why we're doing this one. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I agree. And, and so basically there's this plot where he survives. Zeus saves uh, his, um, his uh, son 
and then he does grow up and then you have this play back and forth. And I like at the end credits, like it kind of shows the end credits breaks down the three different groups that are in this movie. So you have yeah. um, the, the immortals, the mortals and um, the myth, mythologicals, you know? And so you have the immortals, which is like the gods, um, Aphrodite, Zeus, uh, Athena, all of them, um, Poseidon. And then, and then you have the mortals, those who are playing it out on, Midgard or Earth, you know, or uh, but then but then you have the um, mythologicals with the the monsters and the Cyclops and the uh, uh, Medusa, those kinds of things, Pegasus. Um, so you have these three different groups, and the movie goes through this this hero's journey, and what you would basically see, like there's a hero, he gets he he encounters a, a wise old man who gives him, you know, uh, equips him with with wep- the gods equip him with weapons, but this wise old man who is Rocky's trainer, by the way, um, like, um, <laughs> cut me, Mick. Yep. Um, yep. Like, um, sends him on his journey and he encounters a beautiful Did he princess. Freeze? And then there's something going on yes. with that princess. Right. Did he freeze on your end too? Oh, no. Then, yeah. Then I, okay. Uh, did I freeze? Oh, am I back? Oh, I think he's back. back. Can you hear me? Oh, there he is. All right. Uh, you stopped um, at Rocky's trainer. Oh, yeah. Rocky's trainer, Mick. Cut me, Mick. That, that's uh, he was there, but but you know the hero's <laughs> journey of this Perseus is like, um, you know, he's trying to find his way. Uh, he encounters an old wise man. He's equipped with weapons from the gods, and he goes off on an adventure. And then uh, encounters a beautiful princess, has to save her, and along the way he meets monsters to try to save uh, Joppa, who uh, is going to be sent by the Kraken by another jealous god who wants to curse them. But and and they're tempting fate too. I mean, that's basically. You know, the the his love interests mother, Queen, was just so pe- deadpan through the whole thing, whether she's looked at a god talking through a statue or at the very end while she's getting ready to watch her daughter be killed by a kraken. She's just like just damn I was like, What god, show some emotion, woman. But but that's basically <laughs> it. I mean this heroes adventure, monsters, gods, immortals, uh, all, all that together. I probably didn't explain that all right, but it's all there. The hero's journey is all there. This adventure is there. So a couple follow-ups to that. First off, Christian, I'm curious, did you grow up watching HBO all all the time? Because I certainly did not. Uh, No, I was working off of a high school teacher's salary. So we were too poor to afford, you know, even satellite until like I was a little, maybe nine or 10. And then HBO beyond that, that was extra that you couldn't do that. Oh, yeah. I think we would sometimes with cable, it was like once a year, we would get a bunch of bonus channels. It was like to entice you to pay the more money. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, for this month, we have HBO. Woohoo! But uh, okay, so now on to the actual conversation. Um, Yeah, so as Pastor Will's (laughs) <laughs> as Pastor Will uh, explained, it's a big sloppy fight of gods and immortals and humans and these stop motion and uh, stop motion animation claymation creatures, wow. which I also thought was really cool that they were included in the credits for some reason. Not that you know, yeah. it's not like the union was going to sue for them if they weren't included. But hey, glad to know that they were. Um, Christian, they you. Themselves. Yeah, that's what I put on it. They, they, played, they played themselves. They played themselves. They played themselves. That's, that's who they were. Yeah. That was actually Medusa. That was actually a Pegasus. Making Christian, a you're a little, you're a little bit more versed in the actual mythology. So, as an adaption, how how was it? How I know I know there's at least one thing that I'm pretty confident. I'm like that's not Greek, but. Go tell us how, as an adaption, how does it do do by way of the Perseus story? Well, if I were the author, the original author, I would be upset. But they still whoever that was that way, (laughs) yeah, thousands of years ago. And I'll refrain. There's a ton of things I could talk about about what they changed from the Greek mythology. I don't want to like overtake this whole podcast. But there's a lot. (laughs) Like it's not. It's not Joppa in, you know, Phoenicia. It's actually Ethiopia where Hmm. Andromeda is. And, you know, Cetus, the giant whole, is what's attacked, attacks the city instead of the Kraken, which comes from 
Norse mythology. That was the part and, I was pretty sure was rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I remember correctly, Thetis is actually the mother of Achilles and has no mm-hmm. place in the original uh, Perseus myth. And it's not her saying that she's, uh, who'd she say? No, she doesn't make it specific. She just says that Andromeda is more beautiful than the rest of the goddess, uh, the divine mm-hmm. and all that. It's actually the uh-huh. Nereids who are associated with Poseidon. So Poseidon sends Cetus to attack the city and tells them, you're going to give up her. Oh. Perseus saves her. It's kind of like, he wasn't even involved. He just kind of flew past. and was like, what's going on here? Saved Weird. her. Get, now we're married. <laughs> and then move on with life. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Caliburn doesn't exist. Hmm. Oh, excuse me, Calibos doesn't exist. What, what is he called in the film? Yeah. I can't remember now. Yeah, he's essentially like Caliban from okay. Shakespeare's The Tempest. So, and I know my Will, you big X Men guy. That's where yeah, Chris yeah, Claremont yeah, yeah. got his idea for Caliban for the Morlocks. Mm-hmm. In the same way, he can't resist a good Shakespeare reference like Greg Weissman and the Gargoyles can't resist a good Shakespeare reference. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a ton more, but I'll, I'll leave that at there now so I don't overtake everything. Because uh, if this yeah, was points for accuracy, good. I'd be grading this for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, well I, our, my wife and I was, are huge like Cosmos, Constellation, go watch the stars, go watch Shooting Stars fans too. Like we, a big part of her growing up was going out to Stargaze with her dad. And, and we do that every year camping and, and go to like where there's the, the less um, light pollution we could find and complete dark sky and hope the weather works out and, and see the constellations. And she knows where the constellations are and can show and point them out. And so as they're going through this in the movie, um, She's like, oh, yeah, Percy, that, that's the Percy meteor shower, you know, every year, August 12th. And they're, oh, yeah, um, that's that constellation. That's that kind of constellation. Um, and then at the end of the movie, they, they kind of point out, right, big spoiler, you know, the hero wins. And then he's immortalized by being a constellation where people throughout all the ages will look and see the star, uh, the superhero, um, uh forever told their story uh through the night sky and so that that's kind of where that's going so we were geeking out hard on on the kind of constellations and going back to some of that kind of greek mythology but also the constellations in the in the night sky i like how they were able to do the greek the greek mythology was a little meh but the constellation part they apparently nailed it so good job on the constellation part um Producer Cooper watched this movie with me, which was an absolute parenting blunder because I blunder because I totally forgot about the brief nudity in the movies. The kid's tiny. He will never remember it. But like I was like, oh, wait. Oh, yeah, that happens. Um, He really enjoyed the mechanical owl because it's a very whimsical scene because not only is it like making fun noises, but like the music is light and happy. But then on the complete opposite end, he really enjoyed the giant scorpions which is some of the Ray Harryhausen uh, stop motion animation part, uh, which I agree with Pastor Willie talked about a little bit earlier, how, yeah, the graphics aren't great, but it's really cool watching them come to life. There's something about the coming to life part. That's like, that doesn't look great, but it's still like very imaginative. I'm curious for you guys. What are some of your favorite scenes from this movie? I mean, definitely the the kraken scene near the end okay i mean ray harryhausen is working overtime for this i mean i'll talk i'll leave medusa scene out of this because that's really great too but to see this giant figure like i I don't know all the filming terms but like put on the same screen like menacing our characters here even though it's a very small claymation or whatever he's using at that time i'm not i i know a lot of harryhausen but i don't know all the terms he uses for his stuff because I, I just appreciate the man's work. He, he does really great work. And as also someone who's a big fan of his stuff, like it really kind of looks similar to Ymir, who is one of the first monsters he worked on in like 20 million miles to Earth or something like that from the 50s. Okay. So huh. that scene too, and you get the whole build up with Medusa's head. That's the only thing that can stop the Kraken. This Titan, which is not actually a Titan in Greek mythology, but you know what? Sure, for the sake of the film being called Clash of the Titans, we're going to have two Titans that don't exist. Okay, well, well, let's explain that for a second. So what's the difference between yeah. a an Olympian 
and a Titan. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing about Greek mythology, too, we probably should have said earlier. Trying to find an organized canon for Greek mythology is a fool's errand. Okay. Because you're working with a culture, a Greek culture, that then spread across the world and assimilated with other cultures and then said, oh, well, you have this local legend here. Well, that's totally what Zeus would have done. So we're going to say Zeus is your patron god and we're going to call him that. So now you're part of our culture because we say so and we also conquered your island. And that's how things go. <laughs> so when they contacted the Phoenicians, same thing. It's like, oh, we okay. incorporate this part of the, the Canaanite mythos into Greek mythology. And the, the Romans took over and then they took Greek mythology as their own and then Romanized it as they did. So what was the original question? I sidetracked myself. What was the, what's the difference then between a Titan and an Olympian? Okay. Yeah. So the Titans were born out of the original kind of creators of the cosmos. Okay. And as is often the case in Greek mythology, incestuous relationships is how they came into being. Then they have their own incestuous relationships, which leads to the birth of the Olympians through Cronus and Araya, or Rhea, how do you pronounce her name? I've only ever seen it written down. Okay. And Cronus is also total prophecy, hey, like, your son's going to betray you and kill you and become king of this world instead. So he eats his children as soon as they're born, even the girls, just for the chance that it doesn't happen. But they're able to get Zeus away just before that can happen. He eats like a stone statue or something like that instead. He <laughs> rises up, manages to save his family who's been alive this whole time and Cronus's body. And then they take over, defeating the Titans, become the Olympians. They're now the patron gods of Greece. So even though this is like the stories of heroes and gods and monsters, man, this stuff is like a soap opera. Like it is just yeah, very much so backstabbing and dark relationships and just a little bit icky just gets a little icky at times. Okay. So that's the difference between an Olympian and a Titan. Got it. Uh, Pastor Will, I'll come back to you. What's yeah. some of your favorite parts of this movie? Yeah, and, and, and to go back to, again to what we were saying about like it being a soap opera because it's mirroring the human condition and sharing what's going on in our world. And so that it, it, it's not hard to imagine or anthropomorphize the gods and saying they're like me too or what's going on in my world. The drama that I'm encountering in my world and my family and my relationships is happening above the clouds too. And, and that, that's, what's, that, that's what's happening. So um, I find that, um, you know, humans have been telling soap operas because we're part of a soap opera, our own, our own. So, so why not try to work that out? Um, you know, <laughs> our own therapy of telling those stories and trying to work it out ourselves. Um, I, now if you ask 10 year old, 10 year old, will, what his favorite parts of watching clash, the Titans on HBO, um, I would say, um, yeah, the brief nudity parts, the girls getting out of baths <laughs> and, uh, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, um, but but I also love the swords and the fighting and the adventure. And I I love the scorpions, but it, Medusa is it, man. Like, I, as yeah. a kid, I was so impressed. Like, that is a villain. That is a scary, scary monster and almost undefeatable. And him using his wit, not just his might against her and, and his reflection and, and having to capture that head to take it to, is is absolutely amazing. So that, that scene itself is... Is absolutely fan fantastic. So what did what did Cooper think of like Medusa? Like forget brief nudity. He's not gonna remember that. He yeah. this kid's seen right. people naked before. But like the uh, right. um like the monster of Medusa, I would I'm sorry. Even as a ten year old, I like I'm a little freaked out. <laughs> he he actually did okay. He's he's very um I don't want to sensitive, but not like in a bad way towards music. So if it's like this big, like dun, 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 like exciting, adventurous sounding music, he really gets into it. Like he knows like, oh, there's something going on here. And it's it's exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The creature that he actually was a little like was um, the one that's got like the horns and the tail. He's got like the whip in the oh. scorpion scene. That was the guy yeah. who was like giving him a bit of the creepiness, the creepy feelings. Calibos. Yes. And I like yeah, how they the, went uh, between stop animation, claymation with like a real live actor with makeup, like close up on the face. They would do like the face acting 
and but then go back on these these kind of pan out and you see the same he's the he's just like medusa the same clay stop and animation that medusa was i, I found that fascinating watching that just go around it is pretty cool i love practical effects also i apologize if you can hear him crying right now it's bedtime uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I agree with you too. I agree with both of you. It's that Medusa scene, man, that scene when the fight is over and he's standing there with his ultra shiny sword and her head in the other hand, that's just like an iconic scene. That is, that's the money shot right there. That is. And I also agree with Christian, like that Kraken scene at the end. Like he's kind of got like a swamp thing look or maybe swamp thing kind of looks like him. I don't know which came first, but uh, I really it, it is just it's such a cool visual. I love practical effects because it's it's this big towering monster that's probably the size of an action figure in real life, but they just make it work so well. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, so, too, like I watched the second go around like there was. I enjoyed all the the adventure and the and the fight scenes when I was like younger. But watching this, like this whole, I couldn't help but think that these gods putting these like chess pieces, these little clay. So you work with claymation, but you're also working with clay figurines of the main his main characters, and they're pushing them like a like pawns on a chess piece. And I can't help but project and like, man, that's most people's version of like what they think God is like this just big mm -hmm. Zeus figure in the sky who pushes pawns around um, to, to, for whatever fate uh, you know, you are of, of the, the whims and the jealousy of the God. So I, I couldn't help it. Like that's most people's like pop, like pop reference of who they probably think God is on the surface. But you're like, no, the, the, we'll get into this, I guess some, but like, yeah, the, the whole point of like Genesis creation story is to say, we're not that, uh, where that's mm -hmm. not the character of our God who um, incestuous or eat their children or push pawn pieces around on a chess table, like created out of love for love. So anyway, that, that, that amazed me. I was like, yeah, there you go. I thought that was capturing the jealousy and what the gods are up to in their scheming ways was very fun watching it um, as of late or, you know, last night. So for those of you listening, you might be thinking to yourself by this point, that's great and wonderful. I've enjoyed 30 minutes of talking about a nice, cheesy 80s movie. But what does this actually have to do with the New Testament? How do the Greek gods show up in the New Testament? And there's actually at least one. It's one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. It comes out of Acts chapter 17. And in this story, Paul is in Athens. And I, I'm re I was reading the passage earlier out of the New Living Translation because I, I love the language of the NLT and because it's it just makes it all seem so normal. And Paul is in Athens and it says that he was very uh, struck by the fact of how religious they are. There's all these idols and all these shrines. There's a, a Jewish synagogue with Jewish believers and uh, uh, Gentiles who are fearing God, who are in this temple. And Paul goes and he starts talking to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And as opposed to other times when he shows up in a place and they're like, let's stone that guy. They're like, oh, hey, this is all really interesting. Let's take him to the even smarter philosophers and have him talk about this stuff with them. So and it, Luke even has like a little editorial note in there of like, yeah, in Athens, this was like everybody's hobby. It was like they got together and talked about the new ideas that people were having. And Paul goes and he uses this example of you have all these idols. You're super religious and that's great. But you have this one that's dedicated to the unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God. We know him as Jesus. And I want to read specifically, this is Acts 17, starting in verse 27. His purpose, this is God, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen 
from gold or silver or stone. So I want to turn this over to you guys now. When it comes to this story, as Paul is interacting with people who are worshiping either Greek gods or probably at this point, they may have been hijacked by the Romans. So now it's the Roman version of the Greek gods. Um, as you reflect on this story and reflect on these verses I just read, like what stands out to you about this? Hmm. Yeah, like as you said, like he was intrigued by everything that was going around him, the stories and the gods around him and what people were geeking out on. I'm like, this is an episode of Systematic Ecology. He just, he just found <laughs> himself uh, in an episode of Systematic Ecology. He's surrounded by all these IPs, uh, by all these uh, creative stories and trying to figure out how the larger story fits in um, the these other and what he can pull from. And and similarly, like last night, I went to like this gaming um, kind of bar. So people are playing Magic and people are playing Dungeons and Dragons. And there's all kind of board games happening. We're playing this game called Oath, which is very convoluted, but also fun. And I couldn't help. I had so much <laughs> eye candy. I was looking around this place going, golly, I want to see what that person's playing, what that person's playing. And, and, and I all the while wanted to be like, man, they're all intrigued and captivated by a story that they are either telling or or a part of at the minute. So I, I, I felt like I wanted to be like Paul at that minute, be like, oh, we're all part of one green story, cop, capital S, and you're loved by God. Like, you know, th- then I, they would have shooed me away for being a fanatic. But, but I, I couldn't help but relate to that. So I think, you know, Paul is intrigued by the philosophy and, and the poetry and the creativity around him, but also wants to point to the author behind it all. Uh, the the one who who sparked that at, at the very beginning. Um, so um, that that's what stands out to me that they're all geeking out and, and he's trying to like do an episode of systematic ecology and draw out some good theology out of it. <laughs> yeah, this idea that the the Athen the people of Athens got together and just talked about the new ideas all the time. Man, they would have really liked podcasts. Because that's basically yeah. what most of them are. It's like, hey, we're just going to get together and talk about some stuff for a while. Christian, how about you? What uh, yeah. what stands out to you about this encounter of Paul with some Greek god shrines? I hope this doesn't come across as too cynical. Go for it. But I'm captivated by the idea of having a forum like this, a literal forum where people would come together and discuss the latest new idea. But then Paul comes and he introduces an idea they kind of have a concept of, but then brings Jesus into it. And yet there are some of the, that's interesting. Let's talk about that versus the actual response Paul was really hoping for. Like there are people who do believe it is brought out in this chapter. Mm -hmm. But to me, I'm, I'm brought to that point of, Oh, yeah, uh, Jesus is cool. I'll just add him to my list of people I may pray to later on. Mm -hmm. And that kind of breaks my heart to a bit. Be like, you're right there. I mean, you have one of the greatest speakers of all time right in front of you. Like, he could not word things better. And you're just adding his discourse to everything else you've heard before. And I can't help but think of all the people who've done that, even in our modern age. I mean, access to the Bible has never been better than right now. And... I've had professors in the past who were atheists, and they were teaching my New Testament class in college. And it's like, how can you read this book? Excuse me, I, Old Testament, not New Testament. No. How can you read all this and not see the truth? And yet it's just that veil over their eyes. So I don't know if that's just me being cynical, but that's what I kind of got from this. Yeah, I'm sure it happened. Like you said, you go on and some people do turn towards Jesus, but... It is that was, as you were talking about earlier, that was kind of how the Greek mythology grew was like, okay, we're going to take this already existing thing. And now it's Zeus. And now it's this person. And now it's this. So it is possible, especially since they had just like a catch all shrine of, hey, the unknown God, here you go, that there probably were some people who just took it and ran with it. And okay, now Jesus is part of this thing. But it is still. I think the way that Paul t- handles the situation is the most fascinating part for me, you know, because he doesn't just like uh-huh. shove Jesus down their throats in this situation. Uh-huh. You know, he's like meeting them where they're at with things that he with that they know. He quotes one of their poets like all of this stuff is just 
how he handles this situation is the part that uh, stands out to me the most. Yeah, and I like that. Um, I, I think it reveals to me too. There's always going to be compete, competing narratives, competing stories, and there's going to be some that are your favorite, some that you don't like or connect with. Um, but but I do believe, and, and the reason I am a Christian, I believe in in, in Christ, is that I, I feel like that that is the one story um, that that shines a light on other stories to reveal what's true and what's not, you know, that, that it's, there, there is truth in, in all stories. There's things we can glean from this thing, but, but the one true story of, of, of Christ um, is, is the grand revealer of, of all stories and all narratives. Um, and, and I think uh, to me, like Paul there is just like, yeah, like I said, in that, in that gaming bar, like, I was like, man, there's always been competing narratives. There's always been these things all around incorporated and friendships and communities forming around that. Uh, but, but then, but then what is, what is the, the big story capital S how does that, what does that reveal about the others or shine light on it? So. Yeah, it's true. The, uh, the big story, you know, we always talk about, we always talk about G- Yeah. We always talk about how Jesus is like the greater, the greater human, you know, the true human. And it's like, we have all these competing narratives, but here is the true narrative. You know, here is the one that makes sense of all the other ones of all the other soap operas. Here's the one, the one soap opera that works out for everybody. (laughs) Uh Right. So you might be wondering, how does this affect our current culture? Because like we talked about way back at the beginning of all of this, Greek mythology IPs are everywhere. You know, uh, I think it was Pastor Will brought up how Percy Jackson is kind of the the flavor of the yeah. generation with the books, the movies, the upcoming Disney Plus series. But did you did you two know that there are people who still worship the Greek gods? Yes, you did Not know surprised. that. Will, did you know that? Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised by it. I don't know anybody personally who does, but um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Nope. So I figured it would be the case, but I, I did some Googling because I was like, all right, let's find out for certain. And sure enough, apparently in the 90s, back in the 90s, again, when there's this boom of Hercules, uh, there was also a resurgence in what is now known as Hellenism. And it is... Pr- primarily in Greece and is recognized as as a religion in Greece uh, of people going back to worshiping the Greek gods and bringing back the old rituals and the old ways of doing things. Would either one of you like to take a guess as to why people are returning to the old Greek mythologies as their religion? Uh, to be edgy uh to to feel like that they um that the the i I guess it's the age old never ending stand the test of time soap opera that we're all part of and they're like cool this this seems like another soap opera that i feel like is is guiding but guiding our lives but but does it also have to do with like the cosmos the stars and constellations and like those kinds of things as well like our our horoscopes that are tied to these like Greek gods that are named after it. Is that, is that, is that any kind of play at all? I, I would have to go look. I'm assuming it would because like astrology and horoscopes and all that have been popular for so long. I imagine that they would adopt back some form of stargazing, finding, finding story and meaning through the stars. Christian, do you have a, you have a theory as to why, this has been a resurgence. I have some thoughts. I don't know if they're concrete, but I'll, I'll send them out there into the ether as it were. Okay. And like neo-paganism has grown over time in very different areas. Like Norse mythology has had a comeback as well. Some of it on your far right extremist side that we really don't need to delve into too much. And some of it is like a legitimate, like belief in the, you know, the Norse gods are real or some people are, uh, incorporating into stuff like Wicca and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And then for, I mean, why is Greek mythology so appealing today? I mean, I 
put forth that's a very some people would worship in a very hedonistic way. And mm. it says, do what you want. Get your fill. You know, have your pleasure in this world. And that's very appealing. And then yeah, sure we can yeah, hear point. these stories about these kooky gods, but that allows me to do what I want to do already. <laughs> Well, from the articles I was reading, you both are like knocking at the door of why this has been a resurgence. Because you are right, Pastor Will. There is a bit of a mentality of giving Christianity or Christendom, more likely, the middle finger of you came in, forced all of us to convert. We're taking our our religion back. And Christian, you're right. Like neo-paganism has been a super is on this big trend. I worked with a guy when I worked in retail. I worked with a guy who him and his family were Odinist. They worship Odin. They study the Haval. They practice Norse mythology. Um, And if you go to the TikTok or any bookstore, you're going to find all these books on witchcraft, Wicca, astrology, all of it. Like paganism has been on the rise. And in specifically this case of the Greek mythology, it is this middle finger, but it's also them taking back their culture. They see this as a This is part of our cultural identity is to worship Zeus. And we have been away from this cultural identity for so long. It's time that we reconnect with our cultural roots. So do you guys, you know, we're all Christians here and I don't want this to turn into some like big apologetics thing because who knows if you will ever run into somebody who is a Hellenist. I did meet an Odinist, so it's not outside of the question that you may run into a neo-pagan. But as Christians, like, what is our next step as we continue to see a growth in popularity with neo-paganism? Say what it's always been. Get yourself educated. Like, I mean, can you think of, you know, I know more about Greek mythology than I do about, say, Hinduism or Buddhism. Like, I'm already set in certain areas to talk about that, but other people aren't. Like, if you're not familiar with it and you have someone around you that's into Norse mythology, Greek mythology, Egyptian mythology, what have you, well, guess what? We live in that information age where I can just type something in and I can learn everything I need to know. Take advantage of that. You know how much it would have been nice for the apostles to have Google at their hands in the midst of the Roman Empire? (laughs) <laughs> to have the information that we do. I, I mean, we see Paul as a great writer now. Well, imagine what he could do in this modern age. Let's take advantage of what the time and place that God has planted us and use it accordingly. By the way, uh, you said earlier that there was a, a lack of continuity within the Greek mythology, and that is because they do not live in the modern age where there's a bunch of trolls on the internet demanding continuity. Anyway, Pastor Will, like, what is a uh, Pastor Will? What is like? What is your response to this? As you know, paganism continues to grow and become more popular. What's our next step as believers? Yeah, well, you mentioned trolls. You know, it's like uh, in terms of Greek mythology, Norse mythology, trolls are real, y'all. Trolls are real. I believe in trolls. I don't believe in them. <laughs> I just believe they exist. And we must resist them. Uh, no, I um, I, I think I, I think I would go the Paul route. Like, I think, yeah, I think what's behind this is is not only sticking their middle finger to like Christians and more institutions that they feel like have appropriated or colonized their their culture. Um, but, but the truth behind Christianity and, and the depth and the beauty that's there, how do we get past like the empire or the imperialistic or the colonization of it and get to the heart of what, what Jesus was, was trying to say? So, so yeah, maybe, maybe we do like what we've done in systematic ecology. Maybe we do examine and look at these IPs and see what truths draw out and, and look at the poetry around us. I really think what's behind it is and this part of like, spiritual but not religious people still believe in magic still believe there's something bigger out there larger than themselves they still believe in spirituality and 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 um that there's a depth to life and a kind of you know quote unquote magic aspect to to our lives spiritual aspects so what was behind that so is it a pantheon of gods who you know who are um you know 
uh, sleep around and get jealous or, or is there a greater force behind it? Um, and so that, that's where I go, starting to look at, peel back the leathers of what appeals to the spirituality and the truths that, that they're longing for, and then look to their poetry and their stories and see, see how we can captivate this, something that's already there and then nurse that down, down the road um, to, to lead down to who we understand Christ to be. Um, so, so yeah, I, like, I definitely agree with like both theology. of you um, because yeah, you yeah. both have this connecting point of in- yeah but I like I like where both of you are coming at this of like engage engage their stories you know I find it interesting how many Christians and maybe this is because of more so of my background of where I've come from in Christianity, that when it comes to the conversation of like witchcraft, paganism, all of that, the response is more so just screaming that it's evil and that's it. There's no like trying to, no attempt to try and understand not just like the person's like nuance and motive for wanting to be a part of this, but also like just a, basic understanding of what is actually being taught and believed in these scenarios. And and I agree with both of you. Like we need to, we need to get past this mentality and we need to start educating ourselves. We live in the modern age. Google is free, like get a book and start educating ourselves on these beliefs and practices, understanding that, you know, you're not going to be able to know everything, but, and then be able to, sit and talk with somebody if you do actually meet someone and hear their stories and walk with them in their stories and see like Paul, like Will was saying, if there is an opportunity to introduce them to the greater story. Yeah, and that's where relationships I think are important. Like, yeah, the apostles didn't have Google and and weren't necessarily like fully literate and in, in Hebrew. Who knows? They are fishermen. They they might have been. But the um they, the whole like aspect of getting to walk with someone, get to know someone and understand their story, that's going to be the most important depth and part that, that's there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of books and, and going deep dives and learn as much as I can learn. But, but really like <laughs> sitting with someone and getting to know them and, and loving them up close uh, makes, a, makes a world difference. Agreed. And let's go ahead and call an end to this episode. So thank you guys for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here for this episode. Thank you all for listening. As always, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with somebody that you think would get something out of it. Uh, share it with uh, someone who loves 80s movies. Uh, and if you would please consider heading on over to buymeacoffee.com slash MSL pod, uh, you can leave a virtual tip there towards the show or join one of our subscription tiers. Everyone who joins at the $9 of $9 a month level gets a shout out here on the show. So shout out to you, Lori, for supporting the show. Y'all next week, we have an MSL first because for the first time in MSL history, we have the same guest back to back. This has never happened before, shockingly, given the amount of times Josh has been on the show. But we're going to turn right around next week. Christian Ashley is going to be back with us next week to talk about another movie, one we were actually born. We were actually around for this one. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is the movie based off of a comic book, based off of a real event that's full of propaganda. It is our review of 300. And I am so excited to just yell, this is Sparta, randomly throughout the episode. But thank you all for being here. And as always, this is Brandon signing off, reminding you as always that theology is for everyone. So keep on studying.